if you're given the Calvinistic lenses, uh, i.e. told, you know, about total inability from birth and irresistible grace and limited atonement. And that's kind of you're given that systematic way of reading. And then somebody like a, a passionate, very intelligent, very, um, you know, articulate preacher like John MacArthur or John Piper walks you step by step through Romans 9. It really, it really sounds like it's Calvinistic. I mean, that's I mean, what convinced me to become a Calvinist. It, it's what Calvinists talk about dragging them into Calvinism because it just seems so convincing. And it is very convincing if you start with the presumptions, the presuppositions of the Calvinistic worldview. Uh, N.T. Wright is, is really good at kind of pulling things off that grid. Uh, he, he, he does that with almost everything that he talks about. He tries to pull it off of the theological uh, grid of the systematic theologians and says, okay, what does this mean in its context biblically? Uh, and he and he really does focus on biblical theology versus systematic theology. Now, I'm, I'm more of a systematic theologian, so I'm not I'm not trying to put down systematic th uh, theology. Um, I'm simply saying that if your systematic theology is any way <laughs> contradicting your biblical theology, then you've got an obvious uh, an obvious problem. And that's what N.T. Wright is his his emphasis and his major is on biblical theology. What was the author intending in his context? What was Paul trying to communicate in this passage? What question is Paul anticipating and therefore giving an answer to? Because I guarantee you, if you come to the to the passage with the wrong question in mind, then you're going to find the wrong answer. Let that sink in for a second. If you don't know what question it is that the author is attempting to address, you will most likely hear the wrong answer whenever you're reading through the author's answer. And so you have to step into the discussion understanding what the author is intending to address. And this is the big diverging point between Calvinist and non-Calvinist. It's what I address most in my book, The Potter's Promise, is the, the false narrative that Calvinists set up, the presumptions of Calvinism set up before they even get into Romans chapter 9. And it takes some work to deconstruct their preconceptions. And uh, N.T. Wright is really good at doing that, uh, not only for you know Calvinists, but for systematic theologians uh, across the board. He's really good at going, yeah, this is the way you've kind of been taught to think about it because of your systematic worldview. But he, I doubt Paul was thinking of it that way because of his first century mindset and the context that he was dealing with. And so, again, I, I don't necessarily always agree with his findings, but I'm always real hesitant to disagree because he makes a really strong case for why he's saying what he's saying. And um, and and therefore, I think he he sh sharpens my iron, uh, so to speak, iron uh, with my attempts to understand the scriptures and to study them more deeply. And that's what I think he does here in this particular answer. He, he is a, an Anglican priest. He is not obviously from the Southern Baptist vantage point of theology, though, again, uh, I find uh, myself in agreement with him quite regularly when reading through his commentaries on on uh, different passages. Uh, more times uh, than not, I, I find myself uh, in lockstep with the things that he's arguing and saying, and uh, I can't uh, find a lot of reason not to believe what he's saying is true in, in many of the discussions that he's in. Um, so let's go to the video here. Uh, again, I always have the issue with the sound. I cannot tell what you're hearing. Unfortunately, it didn't play into my ears what you're hearing, and I wish that was the case. But uh, nevertheless, here it is. Let me know if the sound's okay. Else I should say, or <laughs> we, we might be able to squeeze in another question for each of you. Uh, Bishop Wright, you have suggested that God elected Israel. This is a corporate historical election. Bishop. But does scripture ever refer to individual soteriological election? And if so, where? Okay. Yeah. He's a bishop. Sorry, not a priest. Uh, Anglican bishop, obviously. Um, um, said that wrong. But notice the question there. Um, he's asked the question about Romans 9 and sovereignty and individual election to salvation. So that's the question that's been posed to him, um, which is the kind of question that if he were to come on my program, which I'd love to have N.T. Wright on the program, by the way, if anybody has connections or knows how to get him to, uh, to I would love to have him on the program. Um, I would be indebted to you if you can help make that happen. Um, I would probably ask him uh, more questions along these lines, like, 
where where is this in Romans nine? I maybe even want to go through Ephesians one with him. Maybe John six. Uh, I would love to go through these passages with him. I've read his commentaries on them, but it, it's one thing to read the flow of what he's saying. It's another thing to ask them direct questions about where they're taking certain uh, you know context uh, of the scripture. And I would I would love 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 uh, to interview him and ask him some really specific questions. Uh, typically, N.T. Wright, in my experience and listening to him, doesn't really like to to hone in on one niche issue like the doctrines of Calvinism versus Arminianism. I, I think he likes to speak in b- bigger, broad scopes. And and I would be perfectly happy in, uh, in uh, doing whatever direction he wanted to go as far as with that discussion. But um, just because it would be uh, wonderful to hear, hear his t- take on some of these things. So here's his answer to the question with regard to Romans chapter 9 and election from a more Calvinistic vantage point. Um, election, the trouble is here, as with several of these other debates, that the words which are used sometimes rather infrequently in Scripture itself have become technical terms within Christian dogmatic theology. This is the point that I have quoted and I've seen quoted back at me um, from Alistair McGrath's book on justification, where he admits that at least from Augustine onwards, the church has used the word and the language of justification to denote something subtly different from uh, the rather specific job that that word has in uh, in Paul himself. And so with election, um, in Romans 9, Paul talks about God's purpose in election in relation to individuals. And that's a tricky one because what he's doing there, and, we, and it's perhaps significant, we haven't actually talked very much about Romans 9 yet, but it, it's a very, very important passage, is that there he is arguing that when you tell the story of the history of salvation or whatever you want to call it, starting with Abraham, it isn't simply that all members of Abraham's family are uh, part of that covenant family through whom God's purpose is to be accomplished. But did, you, did you notice that wording there? I mean, he speaks kind of with an accent, uh, which makes him sound, you know, at least 30% smarter. Uh, and, and and he's kind of going a little bit quick through these, this process. Matter of fact, I always have to check to make sure I haven't sped up. No, it, it's not, it's not uh, sped up any, because I'm so used to listening to things fast speed. I can't tell the difference anymore without actually looking at it. Um, but when, when he when, notice what he's saying it is matter of fact, let me just back that up. By the fact, by the way, somebody corrected me. He's a former bishop. Uh, correct. Yeah, he's not the bishop anymore. Um, and I, I, I should have looked that up before I gave his <laughs> title and all those kinds of things, calling him wrong, calling him a priest instead of a bishop. And he's not currently a bishop. Um, but let me back up. Listen to what he's saying here. I, I want you to catch this part. Members of Abraham's family are uh, part of that covenant family through whom God's purpose is to be accomplished. Okay, so notice what he just said. Abraham's family, in other words, direct descendants of Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, uh, the direct descendants. Not everyone who's a direct descendant of Abraham has been chosen to be the ones who bring the purpose or who are going to fulfill the purpose of God electing Abraham, okay, the nation of Israel. In other words, uh, just because you're a part of that lineage doesn't mean you're going to be used for uh, the noble cause. Anybody remember that from the debate with James White? Uh, which he said, where's that in Romans 9? And we had to point it out. It was from the NIV translation, which I had, you know, that's what I grew up on. So that's the text I used to memorize stuff when I was a kid. So that's the, the term that I use. Honorable use is just fine. Um, in other words, Israel is chosen for this honorable use. What's the honorable use? Uh, to bring the Messiah and the message to the world. It's verse four and five of chapter nine. It's, it, it, it's through you. You're the mouthpiece. You're the oracles have been uh, granted to you, the Israelites, as, as Romans chapter three, verses one and two say. And so what, what N.T. Wright is pointing out is just because you are not a part of the immediate family of Abraham, um, it, it, just because you are a part of that bloodline doesn't mean you are necessarily chosen for the purpose of, of serving God's redemptive purpose and bringing the Messiah through your seed, through your particular lineage, um, or that you're going to be chosen to be a, a prophet or an apostle or a king or some significant person in this redemptive plan of history. Um, so notice the the point he's making is this is not election to individuals being saved. It is election to service. In the short frame for theologians that debate these things, it, 
do you hold to the election to service view or do you hold to the election to effectual salvation view? Um, and that's that's usually the dichotomy that's painted. Now, there's also the corporate election, uh, which Brian Ebishano and others um, are known for promoting. And I and I agree with the claims of the, the corporate perspective. Um, I don't pit them against each other like I think some people do. And I have articles there at Sociology 101 that point out it's not either corporate election or election to service, as some like to, tr uh, to paint it. If you're a non-Calvinist, you need to hold to the election to service and the corporate perspective because both are true. Even Rana Bishano, I think if he were on, and I'm not going to put words in his mouth, but I suspect if he were on, he would agree that, yes, there are some people who are obviously elected to a particular service, like to apostleship, or the nation is elected to a particular uh honorable use. Um, I don't think he would have any issue with that. Uh, the bigger contention is what is in the mind of Paul and how is he addressing these things from his perspective in Romans chapter nine. And that's when it can get a little bit hairy in trying to understand these things when you haven't really uh, done much in-depth study. If you're given the Calvinistic lenses, uh, i.e. told you know about total inability from birth and irresistible grace and limited atonement, and that's kind of, you're given that systematic way of reading and then somebody like a, a passionate, very intelligent, very um, you know articulate preacher like John MacArthur or John Piper walks you step by step through Romans nine. It really, it really sounds like it's Calvinistic. I mean, I mean that's what convinced me to become a Calvinist. It, it's what Calvinists talk about dragging them into Calvinism because it just seems so convincing, and it is very convincing if you start with the presumptions, the presuppositions of the Calvinistic worldview. If, however, you understand the presumptions and the presuppositions of the other side, and someone like myself or N.T. Wright or somebody even much more articulate than I could ever hope to be, takes you and walks you through the text with those presumptions and those ways of thinking, then it makes just as much sense on this side. And, and I'm speaking as from one who's seen both the duck and the rabbit, so to speak, of this picture. I've seen it from both perspectives and, and yes, it may not, for some of you Calvinists, look like it's clear because you have on the Calvinistic presupposition lenses. And I get it because for the longest time, when I was listening to the corporate view guys talking about their perspective of Israel and things like that, I, I was just going, that didn't make any sense to me. Well, corporations are made up of individuals too, so that didn't help you anything. I mean, I mean, it's like uh, Saitan Bernicek was saying like, okay, so nations, that's just more individuals. So big deal. That, that's the kind of attitude I had about the corporate view of election because I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't registering with me what men like Brian Abishano were arguing. Um, and so I was, uh, I wasn't giving them much playtime. I wasn't listening to them when I was a Calvinist. I would just kind of dismiss them. And I really wouldn't take off my lenses long enough to understand their presuppositions before entering into Romans 9, what they were understanding about what the question is that Paul is addressing. Because when you understand the question Paul's addressing, then you won't come up with the wrong answer. And this is what we believe Calvinists have done. Now, again, it's fine for Calvinists to disagree with us. I mean, I expect them to. But they should at least engage with what we're actually saying versus the straw men that are often painted about Arminians or non-Calvinists in general. Um, and and N.T. Wright's perspective, I, I think you can accuse N.T. Wright of a lot of things, but you can't accuse him of not being... Uh, intelligent and, and and knowing his Bible um, and and being very thorough in his exposition of the scripture. And so um, you can say what you will about, about that. So I'm going to back up a little bit more just so you can hear that again and then uh, lead into the rest of the answer. This is only a three minute clip, so it's not going to take long. To get through. It isn't simply that all members of Abraham's family are uh, part of that covenant family through whom God's purpose is to be accomplished, but that God selects from within that. And that's when he says that God's purpose in election might stand not according to works, but according to the call. So you get Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. And, and so far, the book of Jubilees would agree. But then beyond that, of course, it gets narrowed down further and further and further by Paul following the prophetic tradition until in um, two thirds of the way through chapter nine, you have if the Lord of hosts had not left us sperma, a seed we would have been made like Sodom or Gomorrah, which is a quote from Isaiah 1, of course. Um, so what you've, what you've got there is something to do with the choice of individuals to carry that purpose forward. 
Did you hear that? Did you hear that terminology? <laughs> Sounds like exactly. And I'm not trying to equate myself with NT Wright. Okay, but um, this was released in August. Well, at least the, the video that Kevlar put out here, August 25th. I'm not sure when he said this, but um, that sounds like what I was arguing in the debate, that individuals are chosen to carry the purpose that God elected Israel. In other words, God elected Israel to be the, the seed through which the Messiah would be born and to be the mouthpiece, the, the prophets, the, the priests, the kings, uh, the apostles would come through this nation. Um and therefore, they were entrusted with the very oracles of God. And what he's saying is, even though there's people who've been entrusted with this, not everyone from Israel has been entrusted for this honorable use. Uh, in fact, some of them may actually be used for dishonor. They, they may cry out, crucify him uh, on that dreadful day. And that's actually a part of his purpose as well. And that's the interlocutor that would cry out, then why am I to be bl blamed if my unrighteousness brought about your plan of redemption and your glory, then why am I still to be blamed? And so that that's the interlocutor, that's the objector that Paul's anticipating in Romans 9 is the, the hardened Jew who's being cut off in his rebellion and used by God as an instrument to bring about the crucifixion and the engrafting of the Gentiles um, and from the partial or temporary hardening that he was speaking of. And so w w again, when you understand this, Calvinism begins to look like it doesn't make sense. I mean, in other words, it, it begins to make Calvinism look really unrealistic, even more so than what many of us already think about it. Because when you really understand what the what what Paul is addressing in Romans nine, and this is their major hub proof text for the entire system to handle any of the objections and how to fight anybody that's that's standing against reprobation. They the, the Romans nine is the bulwark. I mean, it is the it is the linchpin passage that's in defense of the Calvinist, unique Calvinistic claims. And if it can be demonstrated that the interlocutor is not somebody objecting against reprobation, then they've lost their defense. It's gone. It's There's nothing else in all of scripture to defend the claims of the Calvinist with regard to the reprobation of the non-elect. Um, and, and that's why I try to put so much emphasis on that in my debates and focusing on who the actual interlocutor is, i.e. the hardened Jew who is now being cut off in his rebellion in order to bring about God's redemptive purposes through even the, the rebellious Jews, um, not somebody created for damnation before he was ever born unconditionally, and uh, while others are uh, created for salvation unconditionally before they're ever born, i.e. Jacob and Esau passage taken out of its context. Um, but let me, again, let me back up just again so you can get our kind of running start with, with what N.T. Wright's saying and listen to the rest. Sodom or Gomorrah, which is a quote from Isaiah 1, of course. Um, so what you've, what you've got there is something to do with the choice of individuals to carry that purpose forward. And Paul does not address the question that we who have read Luther and Calvin uh, and indeed many others before and since Aquinas, for instance, uh, always want him to address, which is the ultimate predestinarian question. Does God actually before all time um, determine that certain persons will be elected, chosen, predestined for salvation? Um, he seems determined to stick with his question, which he's much more interested in, which is how God's redemptive historical plan is being carried forward through the people of Israel. And then within that, in relation to specific individuals as it's getting narrowed down. So it, even there, that's as close as I think we can get, but even there, that isn't about what we would mean if we said the phrase, the election of individuals, because that, that's within that larger context, which is how God's... Okay, uh, I'm backing up to go through that again, because notice he says the choice of individuals to carry out that purpose. In other words, when we hear uh, that the purpose of God in election will stand from Paul, what the Calvinist hears is, well, the purpose of God in choosing individuals, certain individuals before they were born for salvation and not others. That's the purpose of God in election. Um, what, what I hear and what obviously N.T. Wright hears is the purpose of God in electing Israel is that the Messiah would come through the nation of Israel and that his message would be proclaimed through the nation of Israel and that that purpose has not failed. It may seem like it's failed because the very people entrusted with this word are standing in opposition to it, at least seemingly so, because all of the major players in Israel are standing against it. All the big names, all the people, it would be like the Republican party, for example, 
if you had Trump and, and all of his cabinet and all the big, big name, um, you know, Bush and all the big name Republicans, I'm, I'm not huge into politics, but um, I know enough to know some of the names of some of the big name re uh, Republicans. If all the big name Republicans were rejecting a particular policy or something, then you might say, well, the Republicans are standing against this. But there might be a remnant of Republicans who actually liked the policy and they were no name Republicans, maybe, you know, congressmen, state congressmen or something like that, that were that were lower on the totem pole that nobody really knew much about. OK, so that you might speak generally. Well, the Republicans are standing against this. Well, not all the Republicans are standing against it. Just the majority of the Republicans are standing against it. in the same way that this is what's happening in the time of uh, the New Testament with Paul. Israel, generally speaking, all the major players, they're standing against the gospel, the gospel of Christ. But this is not new. OK, and th this is Paul's point. This has been happening from the beginning. There have been people who have uh, been Israelites, children of Abraham, who have been standing against the promise of God from the very beginning. And God has always used a remnant of ragtag, no names that that are that backwoods fishermen types. Um, you know, I'm thinking of some of the prophets hiding in the wilderness and wearing bear skins or nothing at all. Sometimes they're naked and they're weird and they're strange and their hair's John the Baptist kind of people, you know. I mean, God has uh, chosen the weak to shame the wise. And typically God is using um, the, the remnant of people that no one else knows to bring about his purpose and his plan to carry his promise to fruition. And it's not through the, the big name, typically the big name people that everybody is always aware of. And so that that's what I think he's he's highlighting is that God's purpose is going to be fulfilled, even if it seems that the nation of Israel is rejecting the gospel. And Paul is saying, no, God's purpose in electing Israel hasn't failed just because of what you see externally happening. Um, God, God is accomplishing his purpose and he can do that. Uh, in, in, in mercying Israel when it serves its purpose, like in the golden calf incidents, when they, uh, they, they are obviously rebelling against God and they deserve to be punished. They deserve, deserve to be destroyed, but God shows them mercy. Um, mercy doesn't mean to effectually save them, by the way. It means to refrain from punishing them when it, when they deserve to be punished. In other words, being long suffering with them. Um, even though they're, they're preparing themselves for destruction based upon their, their rebellion and their actions, God is uh, is patient with them. He's enduring with them. Um, and he can harden them if it serves his purpose to harden them, like he's doing in the time of Paul, where it speaks of a partial or temporary hardening coming upon the nation of Israel, where he's blinding them in their rebellion, speaking to them in parabolic language, as Mark 4 uh, expounds upon. Um, and he's sending them a spirit of delusion, uh, a spirit of stupor, as Romans 11. And uh, I think it's what, First uh, or Second Thessalonians 2, uh, 210 around that area where he talks about uh, sending them a, a spirit of delusion. Um, and and the, the, this is a part of God's purpose and his plan to bring redemption through, yes, even the rebellious uh, people within the, the nation of Israel. Uh, in other words, it doesn't thwart God's plan for the nation of Israel to reject their own Messiah. It was actually used as a part of his plan to bring about the crucifixion and the engrafting of the Gentiles. And that's the point that Paul is answering in Romans 9. And that's what N.T. Wright is, I think, rightly pointing out. 